Thank you everyone for being here um, and joining us at our public program for the exhibition Pedro Pérez back the same day. My name is Karen Grimson. I'm the director of cultural programming here in the Miami Design District and the curator for this exhibition, which is the first presentation of Pedro's work in over 25 years. I am. <laughs> no, self imposed voluntary exile from the art world, we'll call it. <laughs> uh, I am thrilled to be here today with these three brilliant minds to discuss the exploration of temporality and the use of time as a symbol in Pedro's work. First things first, I'd like to introduce our speakers. To my left, Pedro Perez, the artist, born in Cayo Arien, Cuba, 1951. Currently lives in upstate New York in a Usonian community, which is one of the Frank Lloyd Wright communities um, in Pleasantville. Sounds lovely. Pedro, like I said, has been working privately for the larger part of the past three decades. He left Cuba with his parents in 1966, arrived in Miami as a teenage boy, studied art and architecture at the University of Tampa, and received his MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in 1978. For the last 35 years, Pedro has been working as the frame shop foreman at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, if anyone has heard about it. Um, Maria de los Angeles Torres, or Nena as we call her, um, is Distinguished University Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago. She is co-recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant to work on a project on the impact of Cuba's war in Angola on Cubans on the island and abroad. She's presently working on two programs funded by the Mellon Foundation that support graduate students in Latino humanities and is on the editorial boards of the academic journals Latino Oral Histories and Dialogo. Nena has written extensively on Latinos, Cuba, and Cuban exiles, politics, and identity. She's a frequent media commentator on US-Cuba relations and immigration, and was an advisor to the Obama transition team on Latin American issues and on Biden's higher education team. Her upcoming book, Time and Democracy in Cuban Thought, the elusive present is expected for release this coming January. Last but not least, Luis Perez Oramas is a Venezuelan poet, art historian, and curator who received his PhD in art history at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes and Sciences Sociales in Paris in 1993. For the next, for the following 10 years, he was curator of the Colección Patricia Phelps de Cisneros in Caracas, and between 2003 and 2017, he was a curator at MoMA, first as adjunct curator in the Department of Drawings, and as of 2006, he was the Estrella Dabrowski Curator of Latin American Art. He was also the chief curator of the 30th Sao Paulo Biennial in 2012, and consequently curated the Brazilian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. He is the author of several exhibition catalogs and volumes of essays on arts, politics, and social issues, as well as 11 poetry books. His latest books are here on the table for display as well, books of poetry um, and other issues. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Pedro. Three better suited people is to talk about the relationship between time and an art making practice. Like we said, this is your first um, moment exhibiting after since the mid 1990s, voluntarily working privately in upstate New York and in, in New York. Um, this exhibition brings together works from the last five decades. Starting with the earliest painting in the collection of the NSU Museum of Art here in Fort Lauderdale, titled Monsters That Will Prevent People Like Sidney Gillim From Becoming Famous Artists. 
I think that early painting already implies a sense of temporality through not figuration, but through a, a, a connotation of what monsters will do in the future. Um, and then more clearly in the work from the late 80s and early 90s, time starts to emerge as a late motif in your work with clocks that are synchronized, with inscriptions that specify exclusively that time will change all matters. And then in your latest these paintings on drafting fields that you can see throughout the space, a series that fit it in the early 2000s and continues to this day. Here we have about 80 examples of, of the works in the back you can see as well. Um, the back of these paintings carry the information of the date and time when you completed each work. In some cases, they carry more than one date, indicating that you returned to the work to transform it and keep working on it. So how do you understand your relationship to time and what impact do you think that has on your work? Um, my father, my dad collected clocks and collected watches and uh, so when I was a little kid there was a lot of clocks in my house and they all went off at the same time like grandfather clocks you know but for me is I mean I whenever whenever we're going through any period of history you always find a parallel in the time before something that was either similar, good, bad, or worse. And I find those connections to be um, not just interesting, but almost like cryptic. They, they're telling me something. Uh, so, and I don't want to start talking about politics, but if you look at the politics now, and you say, well, this is very similar to this that happened in the past. Yes and no, you know. Um, but I'm also interested in um, Christian religion. I am not uh, practicing anything, uh, but I was raised as a Protestant as a kid. I was actually raised a Presbyterian, of all things, in Cuba. Uh, so, um, and to me, for example, religion, how it plays in our lives, whether we like it or not, the same thing that time plays with our lives, whether we like it or not, is something that, that I, I, just, I think is either is very fascinating, but also kind of scary to me. You know? uh, humanity has had an attraction to religions from the beginning of time. So I, I cannot see the world in, in, in that way. What's happening to me, what's happening to us, what's happening, what happened in the past. And also, for example, when we came to the United States, I mean, Cuba is about three doors down from here, you know. <laughs> um, yet, yet, we were in a country where I was born and raised, we were not a minority, <laughs> but an hour and a half later, you are a minority. <laughs> you, know? you are part of this other group of people that are in some ways less than, you know. And what does it mean to me? What does it mean to, to all of us? And it, that struck me even as a kid, you know, how in, in a matter of, again, a very short time, your life has changed so drastically. The fact that I could not speak the language, the fact that I didn't know what TV dinners were, or the fact that I, all these customs that were in this country at the time were totally foreign to us, to me. As a kid, uh, my parents decided not to live in Miami. We lived in New York City first, and then moved to northern New Jersey in a 
community very separate from New York City. And I was, and then later my brother, I was the only, not just Latino, but any minority in the schools that I went to. Um, and so I got, I got beaten up a few times, you know. Um, and again, this is like ending elementary school, going to high school. Um, and, um, and you wonder like, why is that? <laughs> I mean, why is this happening to me? What, what has caused the situation where I find myself in that all of a sudden I am not, um, I am not a person that, um, that fits in? And of course, it's a, you know, when, you, when you are in a community in northern New Jersey, they have no clue. They had never seen a Cuban before. You know, they... Um, and that's kind of good and bad because you can also scare people with that. <laughs> so, but in any case, it, 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 all, it all has to do with, you know, my timing here and then how my life changes. You know, it, it's, um, it's something that we could talk about for days. But anyway, that's just uh, an idea of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Nena. In your upcoming book, Democracy and Time in Cuban Thought, The Elusive Present, you discuss the concept of time that has been employed by different political projects. How does this analysis of political discourse in Cuban culture inform your understanding of work by Cuban artists? Okay. Uh, I have Okay. Um, First of all, quiero darte las gracias, Karen, because uh, the brilliance is also coupled with tenderness and you really, your sensibility of being able to bring us together is really beautiful, so thank you. Um, very honored to be here with this wonderful artist and poet. Um, I'm a political scientist, and I should give just a little tiny bit background of why I um, started studying time. And I think that, you know, Pedro, we really do have a lot of parallels, all mm-hmm. right, in terms of our lives and the dislocation and, you know, being the first one and only one uh-huh. um, uh, without entering into all the horror stories of the questions that the nuns asked us, okay? <laughs> uh, like, if we lived in trees in Cuba, what kind of trees did we live in? Um, <laughs> a, uh, I think that I, I came um, as a Pedro Pan, that is, unaccompanied children, so there's written a book on that very long story, but I was left with the question of why, why children? And I ended up really um, understanding that for most political projects, at least in modernity, children have been the keys to the future. Right? Um, the political battles are around who controls the keys to that factory. Um, so time became something that I, uh, I was keenly aware of that the ways in which people conceived time and politics and people in those periods of time had a huge impact on people's lives. So I ended up um, uh, moving into uh, looking at time itself as a temporality and what its relationship to politics. The book is very much, um, uh, uh, it rests on the conceptual work of Hannah Arendt uh, and totalitarianism in particular, but not only. Uh, and because her understanding was that in moder- modernity sort of erases the past and moors us from the past and gushes us into the future without leaving any time in the present. And at least from my appreciation, I believe that the present and democracy needs the temporality of the present, okay, of a moment to stop and think, document, hear the others. Um, so the book sort of goes through the past, history will absolve me, and looks at the authoritarian nature of those that only rely on the past, you know. Basically, you know, we've always done it this way, which then doesn't let you do it in other ways. Um, or the future, which also is very compelling, right, to think about the future. But in politics, if all you are uh, is a citizen of the future, that means you're not a citizen of the present. And we have in Cuban thought a lot of you know, references to, um, you know, both nation building, okay, even Jose Martí, which, you know, he's the altar for all of us Cubans, um, you know, really looked at children as a future 
uh, uh, enterprise, not necessarily as what children are in the moment. Um, so I started to look at alternatives to these past and future, and I found it mainly in, in art and in poetry, in Cuban thought. Uh, and um, Eliseo Diego uh, was a poet of a group called Origenes. Um, they emerged in the 1930s as a way to really think what being Cuban was and what it meant to be having an alternative to the corrupt politics. And so they're very philosophical. Uh, and Eliseo was one of the uh, preeminent uh, poets of that group. And his work is really all about time. Um, at, the, at the beginning of the revolution, he had been a teacher, but because he was Catholic, he got thrown out of uh, the schools and was then put as director of children's literature at the National Library and wrote some wonderful essays of what child, trying to teach teachers, right, on how to deal with children, basically saying, you know, you, you, you need to deal with them not how they've been or how you want them to be, but how they really are. And I think that sensibility of the present um, is, it goes on in his own work. Um, Octavio Paz, uh, when he won the Nobel Prize, um, gave a speech basically on what happens after all these utopic projects, you know, the 20th century died, okay, and disappeared before us. And he said we needed to go back to the present, and he proposed a, pro a poetic present, okay, one that you know, could have that sensibility of understanding the other, respectful of the other, um, and to ground its, its uh, the politics in today, not in yesterday or, or tomorrow. Um, I have some of Eliseo's poetry, but I don't know if you should let you read it, but um, I think that um, uh, understanding that in that poetic present we could have a sensibility of democracy, I was left with uh, the, the dilemma then, what do we do with the past and the future, okay? Um, understanding, obviously, that time does not like work that way and it is you know, multi-sided and, uh, and multi-dimensioned, but that's where I went to the works of artists and particularly the works of Nereida Garcia, uh, which Karen had the sensibility to curate uh, uh, a show for her. Uh, uh, because Nereida inserts herself in the past. I mean, in Cuba, like many countries, you know, the, who controls the past really controls politics. And, you know, the, the official rendition of Cuba is that everyone who left was, you know, uh, you know, gusanos or, you know, expatriotas, whatever, expats. And I think that Nereida, uh, and, and that the personal could not be part of the past, right, because it was official. And so what she does is she inserts herself, her own personal histories in her artwork. And um, the series that I work with, she takes old, um, you know, uh, pages of old books, and then uh, she draws upon those, mm -hmm. um, her own family history. Maria Martinez Cañas, uh, who is also a photographer, but a, a collage and artist, I guess you would call. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Maria Martinez Cañas um, has one series where she took the archives of Gomez Sicre, who was the first curator, really, of any Latin American, uh, the Latin American um, exhibit at MoMA, um, nobody wanted his archives. So her father bought them and started giving them to her. And she accidentally, like, took some of the original photographs and scratched them out. And at some point, those of us who may know Maria I mean, would understand this, she said, oh, okay, let me go on. <laughs> so she kept doing it and doing it, you know, to the horror of archivists. For me, what she raises is the question of who owns the archives? In fact, mm -hmm. who owns the past? Mm -hmm. um, Tania Rivera is the other one who, uh, both in Cuba as well as outside of Cuba, has, I think, worked with uh, temporality and briefly just uh, her work, I think, um, is, it, it, it's a critique of the present and an imagination of the future, but one that is tied with the critique of the present. And I think that many of the discourses and songs that came out of the July 11th protest or leading up to it, if you look at the, the temporalities that they're suggesting, is really something beyond these epics, okay, epic narrations, 
or these futuristic um, projects. So um, I think with that, do you want me to read? Oh, I'll do it. Yeah, later. please read. Do you want me to read? Whenever you want. Later. But I was just going to add on to your comment about um, the ownership of archives and the question of who owns then the narrative. An adjacent question to that is what is the value that we impose onto those elements? And I think a work that Pedro developed that speaks very closely to that is this series of clocks from 1992, which are based off of cookie jars that Andy Warhol owned. Cookie jars, the most mundane thing, um, sold at auction after his death for a quarter of a million dollars in 1989, which is totally unprecedented. And the critique of the present in Pedro's work is so clear to me in that series because the question he's raising is, where are we allocating the value of the things? And why is it about propriety um, and not about symbols? So I think he returns it back to symbol, to the symbolic level by making those cookie jars clocks. And that's the centrality of, of time. Um, so with that, Luis, for many years, through your lectures, writings, and exhibitions, you have invited us to think about residual modernities as a means to overcome the opposition between center and periphery. That is, a theory for the wandering, incommensurable forms for which the tight, neat idea or definition of a progressive linear modernity simply does not fit. You have instead proposed an idea of temporality that is not linear, but stratified, which crystallizes in everything from the Freudian notion of double temporality to Avi Barburg's universal compilation of an atlas of images and their perpetual rebirth. Can you tell us a little about how you got to know Pedro, how you learned about his art making practice and how you see this interpretive model play out in Pedro's work. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you to Karen and Lena and Pedro for sharing this moment in honor of our great Peter Perez. <laughs> and uh, you know I met Pedro in 2003. I will give you a little bit of a biographical frame or autobiographical frame <laughs> in order to to, to finish uh, with time, uh, which is, uh, uh, as, as we just uh, saw with, with Pedro and, and, and Nena's intervention, uh, an overwhelming question. I, I met Pedro in 2003 when I, I arrived in this country. I didn't speak English, I barely speak English at the time. I was invited, and of course that's an euphemism, to work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The director told me everybody speaks French uh, at MoMA. Uh, of course, he's a Canadian fellow, and the only language I could speak with him was French, because I had lived in France for many years. Uh, I soon discovered that nobody spoke French at MoMA, but the director, but that a lot of people spoke and speak Spanish, and among them, Pedro and curatorial assistants with whom I was at the time, in 2004, organizing an exhibition of the Latin American collection at the Museo del Barrio, for which Pedro saved my skin, as he saved my skin for so many other projects. And Karen knows something about, because we both worked at MoMA with Pedro. Uh, I didn't know that Pedro was an artist, uh, but I soon understood that having been the person in charge of framing the collection at MoMA for many, many years, Pedro had inflected with style and elegance and with subtilitas, beautiful light, uh, solidness and, and color, the very look, the appearance of the entire collection at MoMA, of the most important collection of modern art in the world. And that is not a small achievement, and uh, it's maybe muted and sometimes overlooked, but I think it's important, it's very important. And the way he had done that uh, so, so elegantly and, and so, so in, in, in connection with what works of art dictate they need in order to be exhibited. 
And you know, I, I was coming from from I was coming from Venezuela, but I had lived in France, as I said, and as I can say, for many years. I, I, I completed my PhD at the Ecole Institute under the direction of two philosophers, an art historian, one is Louis Maha, passed away, the other one is Yvel Ami, just passed away. But not only my mentor, Maha, was very much uh, interested in thinking about frames and about what we call the paradigm in, in Greek, which is ergon is the word, and paradigm is all what surrounds the word, that goes from frames to labels to wall texts to opinions to whatever institutional frames and decisions are. And my mentor used to quote a letter by Nicolas Poussin, the, the 17th century French painter. Uh, Poussin sent a painting to a client who had commissioned that painting, and he sent the painting alongside a letter. And in that letter, this is my, my a clumsy translation from the beautiful French. Uh, uh, he said that to the client, uh, as soon as the painting arrives, it needs to be ornated by a little bit of cornice, a, a, a pipe de corniche, a little bit of cornice, a little frame, so as it will be considered in all its elements, the eyes, rays of the beholder being contained and not dispersed, neither troubled while receiving neighboring objects and species that confound the day as they come in disorder vis-a-vis the things the people. My mentor loved to quote that letter and he loved to comment in length that letter. And he used to say that Poussin's letter poses painting as a void painter, that Poussin's letter poses painting as a missing painter as an emptiness until the frame is placed on it in order for it to exist against the surrounding reality, intentionally the visible. So I was very aware of all this when I began working at MoMA and uh, I thought I was very attentive to, to the fact that this, this person with whom we were working was in charge of that very important task. Uh, now, I know Pedro was also uh, very, very aware that frames institute, <coughs> institute art, that they give you, a, they give you works of art stability, uh, a, a presence in terms of their, of their appearance, which is probably a fleeting form of presence, but they also mark Time. They also carry their, their own temporality. Uh, we were working on that exhibition in 2004, so we were dealing with works of art that had stayed for years in the basement at, at MoMA, or that had not been exhibited for years, that were framed with frames marking an old-fashioned temporality. So we were also working with the materiality of time by trying to bring those 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 words to the present moment of their exhibition. Uh, I don't know if you have realized that none of the works that are exhibited here is fair. <laughs> so, uh, no friends, no institution, no will of instituting anything, no prison time. So, this is the first thing that really caught my attention is that this seasoned and elegant framer who is an artist has decided to show the words and frame. <laughs> and uh, so I want to take it from there in order to get to time. Uh, I think that Pedro has built his art uh, at a place slightly aside of the institution of art, maybe because he knows it very well. So that, that, that play that he has built for the production of his work, an isolated play, the Cote, uh, is, is certainly a place of freedom. It's an island, and, and I recall you that island is utopia, from which continuing working while watching from a quiet corner, becoming of the world as it unfolds. And I am quoting the game, Nicolas Poussin in another letter, saying, I live in a quiet corner from which I can see the comedy of the world. 
follows. Uh, I, I want to recall here because that I, I, I've never seen Pedro's work, and I'm actually I'm discovering Pedro's work. Mm -hmm. But I saw one work one day, mm -hmm. and it was someone who was very special for Pedro, and that Pedro had the generosity to introduce me. He was named Leo Rapkin. Leo Rapkin was a, a, a friend of Pedro, a, a pioneer in defense of abstraction in this country. Uh, and he praised enormously Pedro for it. And, and I, I vaguely recall that moment. Pedro introduced me to the Iraqi, then we became friends. And I recall that moment when I saw this strong, decisive, expressive composition in red tones. I was trying to remember today while having breakfast with Pedro. Pedro, <laughs> it was a red composition that Leo on. And maybe something like Monsters from that moment, maybe that, that, that strength, that, that expressive force, and, and if I don't remember clearly the composition, I remember absolutely as it was today, how it struck me, uh, uh, as, as, as that moment happens in a present that stayed with me. You know. As I said, I am discovering with you uh, Pedro's work, we are we're talking time, uh, I think that that work with, with clocks, uh, all trying to to bite a moment of time, to, to frame a moment of time, which is impossible, is a beautiful pretext for something that Pedro and Nena and Karen had mentioned, is this idea of a multiplicity, multiplicity of temporality. So the fact that time is not unique, time is not one time, time is not universal. Uh, we know today, scientifically, that the only uh, basic law of physics that distinguishes past and future is entropy. Uh, we know that time doesn't appear in the fundamental equations that describe reality. Uh, we know that following Einstein's equations, time only exists locally and in function of positions. And I do think, to answer your question, that art history has not yet understood consequences of that. And that our history had a very hard time to reinvent itself while thinking what does mean temporality in terms of the way works of art function. Uh, if, if we like to think, if we like to think our history in sync with what reality is, Scientifically, we need to we need to try to understand something that Nena mentioned, and talking about political issues, is the absolute importance of presence and and, 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 and the time. works of art are only they only exist in present, and if they are not in relation with other works of art, they they vanish as elemental particles in reality only exist when they are in relationship with other ones and they vanish. Uh, that, let me quote a, a, a physicist that I, I don't know anything about quantum physics or I, don't, I, I, I cannot even, I mean I am very bad even doing the count of my very single uh, domestic numbers. But I have been reading this physicist, uh, uh, Carlo Rovelli, I really recommend you to, to get his book, because he is an extremely enlightened uh, science, uh, scientific mind, but also cultured, and he, he makes this beautiful relationship with literature and art, and he explains to you these groundbreaking uh, evidences with a clarity and with a beauty that I have not encountered before. And he says this, in the, in the elementary, equations of the world, the arrow of time appears only where there is heat. Every time a difference is manifested between the past and the future, heat is involved. In every sequence of events that becomes absurd if projected backward, there is something that is heated up. Mm -hmm. I love that, 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 that thing, and I love that thing in terms of what the the energy of art brings 
to their manifestation, to the, the energy of water will be to the manifestation as presence and as present. So we know that what we call real time doesn't exist, that uh, what that, that is an illusion of a very limited form of perception, that between the past event and the future there is only an extended form of present, a duration, uh, uh, now exactly as we experience does exist. And I, I found these quotes by Santos King who thought of time. He says, there is no time before the world. And he, he, he questions, and he makes, he, he offers his question, Ubi es tempus which means, where is, where is that time that we call long? Where does that time that we call long is? And he answers, in his soul. And then he questions, what is the space? And this is incredible. Right? Sometimes we start asking, what is the space of time? Because we know after Einstein that time only exists in terms of space time. And he asks the question, what is the space of time? And he answers, some dilation. One distension. Where? And he says, precisely, in this suit. In this suit. Minutissimus momentum, hyper minimal instance, only that exists, only that is present. The sort of plantlet of time. Uh, when I was in Caracas, uh, last year in Caracas, before coming here, we invited the French philosopher Jean Francois Lyotard to give us the last seminars, and Lyotard went to Caracas. He was at the time working on a book on Santa his last book that stayed unfinished. And I remember you are discussing that and working on that in Caracas. And uh, that book was published, it's a beautiful book. And I, this, this beautiful quote, time is only measured vis-a-vis -vis affection, l'affection. Time is only measured vis-a-vis -vis the very singular way things touch us as they eclipse themselves. And Augustine says, torrents flow fluid. The torrent of things flow. El torrente de las cosas fluyen. That is almost an Eliseo Diego verse. Yeah. So, you know, we are in this, this exercise of thinking heterochronies and heterotemporalities. But certainly what we need to understand is that the appearance of a continuous time, which is the fiction of art history, is an illusion. And that art history is made of jumps, leads, saltos, something that the poets had understood. Lesama called it the absolute suddenness. And Lorca said in that beautiful conference on El Duende that the Greek mythologist jumped until the dance horas, the bailarinas, the dancers in Cadiz. And I think that is the matter with which we need to rethink our relationship with time, but something that the artist knew <coughs> and, and the poets also advanced. Thank you, Luis. Um, one of the other great fictions of art history, still very embedded in our narratives, is the, that difference between the center and the periphery. Uh, and I think we run into this, this issue when we think about the frame and the political connotation of the presence of a frame as a borderline, like you said, the paragon between the work and the world. Um, if we're so invested in repositioning this model of the center and the periphery, um, how do we make sense of your aversion to the frame? How do you make sense of it? I was invited to come to the Museum of Modern Arts because there was going to be an exhibition of uh, Phil Custa. And, uh, and I was asked if I could come by and talk to the curator and give him an idea of what uh, 
you know, what is it that he would have, how would he have framed his own work? The reason I was asked is because I knew Phil. So I went there and I said, yeah, he would like this and that and the other, goodbye. So then he called me back later for something else. Eventually, I started to work there and, and, and um, it, <sighs> I've known Luis for many, many, many years, and Luis did not know that I made my own art except for the piece that he sold with uh, Leo. I, so I wear these two different hats. You know, I, uh, when I'm at the museum and in that particular world, that's what I do. I, I try to make the art, and of course, Mama has a, an amazing collection, I try to make the art as strong as possible, and a frame can help with that. It can also distract. It could also uh, destroy the work. So I, it's not that I saw myself as having a particular mission, although it kind of became that at a certain point, that I could see the art in the collection and I felt uh, this work needs help. Uh, not because I am a magician or because I was arrogant, it's just that I felt that I could help in a way with the artworks. But um, a friend really works best when it stays very quiet, when it doesn't call attention to itself, but it's enhancing, it's enhancing the artwork in ways that you are not really aware of. Many, many years ago, uh, there was a curator at MoMA that I respect a great deal, uh, Kirk Barnado. And Kirk asked me if I would take a look at the Zaysan Bather, which has been in the collection for a very long time, uh, because he did not like the frame that was on the bather. I objected to it because I felt that, in fact, I thought that frame was quite beautiful and it worked really well but being there was Kirk I said let I said to him let's go through the exercise so I said to him do you want the figure to come to you or do you want the figure to go back into space and he kind of like what are you talking about are you so, <laughs> yeah <you're saying laughs> and I felt that the, the figure should be coming towards you so I, I made two frames in which it did that. In, in the one frame, the piece comes forward. In the other one, the figure recedes back into space. And he kind of like said, wow, that's weird. <laughs> and so what I was trying to show him that the frame that, it came, in, uh, that came on the work with the collection of Right to MoMA, into the collection of MoMA, that frame was original to the work and that it worked rather well. Um, I still don't understand why I do what I do. I, 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 it, it baffles me every single day that, that I'm in that museum and that I meet certainly wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people and I really enjoy that. And there's Heidi who I love so much. <laughs> we have become close for so many years. Um, but, and I have to say, I, it's not like I go there and I start thinking about my artwork. No, that happens when I leave the museum. I, I used to, because my studio was in the Bowery for many, many years, I would just leave MoMA, take the train directly to, to my uh, space and, um, and work until very late at night in my studio. But um, I... I the reason why you see these works that, that are on drafting film uh, is, um, is because I just want that image. I, I just want you to pay attention to the image. I don't want you to pay attention to anything else besides the image. There's no composition beyond that. A frame would actually interfere with that, with that, with that vision that I have. Now, I also understand that because they're on Mylar, and, and actually that's a very durable uh, material. Um, they need to be framed. 
uh, you know, they can only last so long without a frame on them. And so I had said to Karen, there is a way that I do that and there's a little piece back there that has a frame. So if somebody wants to see it in a frame, that's what I would do for that. I, I, <clears throat> I see the <clears throat> frame more of as a necessity rather than anything else. But when you're talking about works that are done in the 19th century, and for example, uh, <clears throat> what is it the artists of a particular era would hoping to get out of a frame and there's a whole history of how you know certainly for example Degas Degas actually did drawings of how he wanted his work to be framed and they're in the collection of the Met um, and so there is a Degas profile that he invented for himself and so there are artists that pay a lot of attention and then artists that don't really care at all Picasso kind of falls in between those two uh, he would go shopping for antique frames many times, and then he would like use them or not. I, I don't. Sometimes he painted on them. So, <clears throat> so to answer that particular question, I, I, it's, it's almost like the same thing. For instance, <laughs> and I have gone this so many times that there's a lot of, you know, my name is Pedro Felix Perez. So it's been <laughs> since I since I was born, but in this country, a lot of people always know me as Peter. And there's a whole story behind why my name is Peter. And I was mentioning to someone last night at the dinner that in, 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 in Cuba, for instance, very few people are known by their given name. Um, everyone has a nickname, and so did I. So I was, my family knew me in a specific nickname. When I went to school, my name was Pedrito, uh, which was also my brother's, my older brother's name. He, he was Pedro Perez, I was Pedro Perez, my father, my grandfather, and my mom, before she got married, her last name was Perez, and her brother was Pedro Perez. <laughs> so, so when I came here, I became Peter, and that's how I'm known, and that's my email address, and MoMA is, is Peter. I, I don't, can I tell you that I don't really have, a, it doesn't really affect me much one way or the other, whether you call me one thing or the other. Uh, and, I, and I've thought that about so many times, like why is that? Why is it that I have this kind of dichotomy, that there's two personalities? Um, and so one time in a conversation with, uh, a poet, John uh, Yao, uh, we talked about that, like, you know, us immigrants, uh, I'm sure there's some of us in here, <laughs> many here, immigrants, uh, we um, live mentally, say psychologically, in two different worlds, in the world of here and the world of fantasy. The Cuba that I left hasn't existed in a very, very long time. And, uh, and I have, I refuse to go to Cuba because I do not want to destroy that fantasy that I have. Um, I had made a comment some, sometime that I, I have this vision and I was talking to uh, my friend Ramon right here. We have a very uh, close friend to both of us. And, um, and I said to him once, because he also said, I don't ever want to Cuba, go back to Cuba again. He was in prison in Cuba. He came, he, he was a Marilito, uh, uh, Rene. And um, he said, I never go, want to go back to Cuba. But of course, he was in prison for being gay. And to me was, I have this, not a dream, but a, 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 a kind of a, a sad, horrific thought that keeps coming back to me. And that is that I see myself going to Cuba by myself, not with anyone else. And then the plane gets there, opens up. I go down the steps because there's no tarmac. <laughs> I go down the steps and as I hit the ground, I die. And that keeps coming back to me, to me, to me. Two of my daughters have been to Cuba. My middle daughter, uh, 
some years ago, she said, oh, Dad, I don't want you to be upset, but I want to go to Cuba. And I said, great, I'd love for you to go there. I'm not going, but, but you should definitely go. <laughs> and I said, so what are you going to do in Cuba? You know, knowing the conditions, she goes, oh, I'm going to a yoga retreat. <laughs> and I said, a what? <laughs> a yoga retreat? It's <laughs> like, please, you know. So, so I thought, boy, Cuba has changed. <laughs> <laughs> My youngest daughter, um, Nyla, um, she has a degree in comparative religion. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> And she, we went to India <clears throat> years ago with her when she was still in elementary school because she was interested in different types of religion, Buddhism, <clears throat> Christianity, all different religions. Now she teaches. Um, she's not a Christian either. So <clears throat> she said, she taught me later, and this happened like only two or three years ago, that she was going to Cuba because she was very interested in Santeria and studied like, you know, Afro-Cuban religions. I had years ago done a film that was never finished because I was doing a film about the roots of American jazz as it relates to the slave trade mm -hmm. and New Orleans. And so I wasn't going to Cuba, but I went to, I spent some time in Trinidad filming the carnivals there and New Orleans. So, um, so I gave it to Nyla and she said, here, this is what I've done, you know, about that subject. And she, so she went to Cuba and she went to my hometown. And she came back, not knowing much about my background, she said to me, I can see why you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. She found the whole experience very sad. She sat in the same park where, as a little kid, I used to roller skate. Um, and she looked over at the elementary school that I went to, uh, near the park. And so she came back and she said, you know, um, I, I think I know you better now. Hmm. And I said, well, you're going to have to explain it to me because <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of problem with it. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. Um, you've been having these wordless conversations with all these magnificent artworks, the best collection of modern art in the world, having this silent back and forth with these images about the frames. Um, before we turn back to the words of our poet, and Nena will be reading a poem by Eliseo Diego, and Luis will be reading a poem of his own authorship, um, I just want to wholeheartedly recommend Nena's book, oh, <laughs> which is a compilation of um, not, her most, not her most recent book, but um, a book that came in really handy to me to understand the complexities of different exiles, different forms of exiles, different ways to relate back to the motherland when you can, how it changes through time. Um, By Heart is a compilation of different Cuban women's journeys out and back into Cuba. Um, and by heart is the way we tell ourselves these stories as well. So our, our defining stories, the stories we tell ourselves to survive. Um, so with that, I'd love for you to bring Eliseo to our table. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about your relationship with Eliseo un poquito. Bueno, okay. So um, when... Many of us who were raised in the United States, born in Cuba, raised here, I think they call us one and a halfers, okay? Um, sort of splitting the baby one way or another. But um, when I returned to Cuba, um, I was part of a group of uh, 
of Cuban Americans that we were really looking for alternative politics and really our, our childhood homes. I mean, mm -hmm. our childhood homes. Um, and um, as, as we see right now, the Cuban government's holding like a, a meeting with you know, uh, exiles and welcoming back. They say they even have like people waiting at the airport and applaud when people come. <laughs> uh, remember that a lot of times we were kicked out, okay, on the other hand. So depending on the policy, usually depending on how much money they need, uh, they either like us or they don't. Uh, but um, two poets um, uh, always kept their homes open for many of us. And one was Pablo Armando Fernandez, who was part of Lunes and Revolución, poets who had left, in fact. I mean, he was more a beat poet, you know, initially than he was a, a Cuban poet, whatever that means. <laughs> Uh, and he went back to Cuba. Uh, but they had a lot of conflict with Origenes, where Eliseo Diego was a member. And, um, but both of them kept their homes open. And I think that, personally, um, we hosted Eliseo once. Um, Matt, what year was that? 1982 or 83 in Chicago. And um, we became very close friends with him. And um, he also, I mean, he, uh, we were living together, we weren't married, and so he helped, if you will, sort of pave the road for us to finally get married and uh, wrote some beautiful things that we used at our wedding. So we always called him the godfather of our, of our wedding. Um, Testamento, unfortunately, I don't have it uh, translated into English. I will try to do my best to summarize it when I finish. It's not super, super long. Um, But he says, Habiendo llegado al tiempo en que la penumbre ya no me consuela más y me apocan la... Did I turn it off? No, no it's good. Okay, it's fine. Uh, y me apocan los presagios pequeños, habiendo llegado a este tiempo, y como las heces del café abren de pronto ahora para mí sus redondas bocas amargas, habiendo llegado a este tiempo, y perdida ya toda esperanza de algún merecido ascenso de ver el mar sereno de la sombra y no poseyendo más que este tiempo no poseyendo más en fin que mi memoria de las noches y su vibrante delicadeza enorme no poseyendo más entre cielo y tierra que mi memoria que este tiempo decido hacer mi testamento es esto, les dejo el tiempo todo el tiempo.